Villains are never born, they are made. For every great hero putting his life on the line to save the day, there's a comparable adversary acting as a roadblock to this endeavor. And just like the hero, they have their own origins. Gone are the days of the snidely whiplash types concocting dastardly plans just for the deadly do rights of the world to foil them. Being evil for the sake of being evil doesn't cut it, for it's a shallow justification to uphold a black and white moral standard that refuses to examine the shades of gray. If it's expected to inspect the stitching quality of the hero's quilt from their humble beginnings and everything after, then it must be acceptable to understand how and why the villain's quilt is ripped to shreds. And in this essay, we'll be looking at three. Any business worth their salt is tasked to meet the demands of their customer base by having an ample supply of the item they sell. That means making sure there's an even flow of products leaving a warehouse's production floor to be delivered and stocked on store shelves and eventually purchased by the customer with little to no disruption to the supply chain. In the case of an energy producer, create more than enough energy to supply the grid so a negative supply shock can be avoided. Unfortunately for Monstropolis, their electrical infrastructure is at risk of experiencing an energy crisis and the monstrous decapod weathering the storm is Henry J. Water News III. Jovial with his colleagues yet concerned with the legacy of his family's company and the state of energy consumption, Mr. Water News will do whatever is necessary to keep his ship sailing. He's a monster who values tradition being the third generation to run Monsters Inc. and swears by the screams of children as the reliable energy source. Most would raise an eyebrow at the sentiment, but once we examine his views and his company's mode of operation, it'll make sense. For three generations, the Water Nooses through the family business used the most frightening monsters on the payroll to siphon screams from children which is then converted into the energy that is delivered to their customers, which raises a few concerns to say the least. But here's a fun fact. When you paint human children as an existential threat to monsters, it really smooths over a scare's ethical dilemma about their line of work. For all they know, they're bringing a rabies-ridden dog to heal while tangibly contributing to their city. It's a dichotomy Water News III relies on to satisfy the needs of his customers or else nothing would get done. Although he holds this bigoted notion, the citizens of Monstropolis share this fear. So much so that if a monster has visibly touched anything in the kid's room, a 2319 is initiated until the object is neutralized and the monster effect is chemically bathed and shaved, a fate no one wants to be on the business end of, meaning the boat is not rocked and the machine can continue moving. These days, however, scaring techniques have dulled as new recruits are brought into the fold. Kids aren't getting scared like they used to, even building up the courage to try touching a monster which puts employees in distress, and because of the decrease in fear, dead doors are popping up more frequently, meaning that it's a subtle indication that Monsters Inc., Water News's legacy is falling on hard times, and when things fall on hard times, any solution is on the table to reverse the trajectory. So with the help of the company's number two scarer, Randall, and his assistant Fungus, they develop a machine called the Scream Extractor, built to suck out as much of a child's screams regardless of its damaging effects. Much like how Mr. Krabs built the factory that milks the jelly from jellyfish and tosses them aside after seeing its popularity among customers in the season two episode Jellyfish Hunter. The difference being, Mr. Krabs desired an increase in revenue in his restaurant, whereas Mr. Waternoose is driven by just keeping the lights on. And continuing to live up to his company's slogan, we scare because we care. But despite having many eyes, his desperation and need to stick to tradition blinds him to the actual solution to his energy production problem. See, the emotional spectrum of human children is a powerful resource in the world of Monsters Inc., with the water nooses being able to use their screams to provide power to Monstropolis. Unfortunately, it stops there, with the company only developing new scaring techniques and technological solutions all around the emotion of fear. This can hamper any opportunities for additional R&D into new energy solutions. If kids these days don't get scared like they used to, then how can Monsters Inc. meet the customer's energy needs when the well runs dry? Which is where his top scarer and pupil, Sullivan, comes into play. He sees the power of this emotional spectrum firsthand as he watches Boo's laughter light up their section of the neighborhood, breaking the lights in the section of their workplace, and being able to activate all the doors in the Monsters Inc. facility. Considering that laughter produces 10 times more energy compared to screams, it presents an effective counter-argument against the tried and true resource. Also, having a positive relationship with the subjects that fuels the infrastructure of your city is better for business because it's easier for them to provide what you want after getting them to laugh versus pulling teeth through triggering their fight or flight response. Mr. Water News through his stubbornness neglects to do the research and make the necessary change to his company, opting to kidnap a thousand children before letting his family's legacy go under by robbing them of what is essentially their life force. But to his chagrin, he shows his hand to the CDA who proceeds to bring him to justice. Henry J. Water News III, a bit businessman desperate to course correct his company through unethical means inadvertently ousted himself from the position he held in the company his family built. But don't worry, it's in the hands of more capable management. I don't 
Syndrome is what happens when a fan finally has a chance to meet the figure they idolize. Once named Buddy, a kid with near limitless levels of misguided optimism aspired to become the Robin to Mr. Incredible's Batman, which doesn't go over so well considering the hero views himself as a solo act who sees no need in building an ensemble of heroes. This obsession leads Buddy to confront his idol inside of a building attempting one last time to convince them of his usefulness. Unfortunately, Mr. Incredible distances himself further, proclaiming he works alone, and completely cuts ties with Buddy after he saves him from a bomb attached to his cape. To say this moment demystified Buddy's idea of heroism, let alone how he viewed the idol he worshipped, would be an understatement. The way The Incredibles world works is that those with extraordinary abilities, superhuman strength, flexibility, or cryokinetics are the exceptional individuals capable of dealing with extraordinary circumstances so the average citizen need not apply outside of working as a first responder. Buddy, at face value, is a boy of unexceptional abilities who is way out of his depth for what he wants to sign up for. However, he's intelligent. And with his intelligence, he invents gadgets like his rocket boots that can level the playing field with his genetically gifted counterparts. But Mr. Incredible does not care that Buddy wants to fight the good fight by his side. He doesn't care if Buddy can make things to help him match his step. Why is this fan with no powers at a place he knows can make him a liability? Hearing that worldview from the person he once saw as his god completely devastated Buddy, which causes two things to happen. His disillusioned perception of supers, especially for Mr. Incredible, and the birth of his new identity, Syndrome. If he can't be super, let's make everyone super. And when everyone's super, no one will be. And in 15 years, he gets the ball rolling. Operation Kronos Because a super is defined as someone with superhuman abilities who fights crime, the first thing on the to-do list is to dilute the definition of the idea. Although it helps that costume heroes fighting crime has become illegal, a more permanent solution best fits this body. Behold the Omnidroid. A hero-busting automaton with AI capabilities that records battle data from any and every super it confronts. Using his agent Mirage, he lured former supers to Nomanasan Island, posing the situation as a robot wreaking havoc. But little did they know, they would be the machine supply of lab rats. When one prototype is decommissioned, another is created with improvements in the information from the last, and continues to decimate more supers on the queue until it becomes strong enough to dispatch Mr. Incredible, his greatest foe. Although Mr. Incredible won the day against the Aethodor, he eventually met his match against the ninth. He's also reacquainted with a more distorted version of the follower he denounced 15 years ago. A vain, narcissistic, compassionless coward that only finds pleasure in superficial attention, plus the satisfaction of becoming the face of supers once the others have been eradicated, and eventually sell his zero-point tech to the public, granting everyone the capability of stopping crime effectively, thus making the idea of superheroes moot. His plan almost echoes how the Titan Kronos consumed his children to prevent the prophecy of his progeny turning the blade against him, with his son Zeus being his usurper. And just like Kronos, his negligence would be his own undoing. His Omnidroid Mark X may have been too optimized, since it identified its creator's remote as a direct threat, shooting it off his wrist while he feigns his heroics, causing him to turn tail and run. With the day lost, Syndrome's final attempt at victory over his formal idol tries kidnapping Jack-Jack. Ultimately, he fails and meets his end via jet turbine. Syndrome, a brilliant mind gone to waste because the idol he tried to emulate denied him. Tai Lung, the snow leopard who was promised the world but was given disappointment. Found as an infant at the steps of the Jade Palace, Shifu takes the boy in, raising him as his own child. Once he saw the little one attack a training dummy, he recognizes his natural affinity for combat and decides to teach the boy Kung Fu. And from watching his student excel at this skill and exceed expectations, praise is delivered, which is what Tai Lung wanted, but goals are increased, going as far as telling the student they are destined for greatness. So Tai Lung begins training until his bones cracked, and following his master's fighting techniques and finding his opponent's weakness and making them suffer for it. The tenacity, the punctuality, the ruthlessness, and other characteristics Shifu would critique his future pupils to have more of are all wrapped into a single body he considered his son. And Tai Lung absolutely loved the attention he got from participating in his father figure's martial arts training. When he excels, Shifu showers him with praise. The higher the expectation, the more praise he gets, despite the pain. Knowing that his performance placed him on the path of greatness plus the positive feedback he gets from his master, becoming the dragon warrior and reading the content of the Dragon Scroll will justify the path thrusted upon him while gaining the most praise from his father figure for achieving such a lofty goal. However, while Tai Lung's Kung Fu is mechanically a cut above the rest, he lacks the emotional component. Although he is loved by his master, Shifu, by way of his teaching philosophy, sets him up for failure. Though he cannot control what fruit bears from a tree's branches, nor the time it takes for the tree itself to blossom, but once the tree fully blooms, if he can control when the fruit falls and where the seed is planted, that's enough to work with. There's no 
need for gentle cultivation so long as the seed turns into a tree, which is true. One can most definitely control those variables and the tree can grow. But when one neglects how fertile the ground is when planting the seed, or based on the location whether it will get enough sunlight once the seed sprouts, or the quality and quantity of water its roots absorb, a tree may sprout, but it won't grow to its fullest potential. Heck, the fruit that it bears could be inedible, which was the darkness Ugwe sensed in Tai Lung when evaluating whether he was fit for the role of Dragon Warrior. Sure, he knows how to move, but does the flame ever dim? Does he know humility? Is he capable of abstaining from fighting when the opportunity presents itself? Which is why he rejects Tai Lung. Being one step away from achieving greatness and having that taken away is difficult to cope with. Watching as your father figure, the person you believe supported you, follow his mentor without even attempting to vouch for your destiny. A destiny that he built up and you internalized is soul crushing. Now these new feelings of confusion, frustration, and disappointment are present and Tai Lung has no idea how to deal with them, except by attacking the valley until he had to be subdued and carted off to jail. He had neither the emotional nor the psychological tools to deal with missing the mark, so he used what he knew best to terrorize others. Quick tangent, there's the psychological concept called the frustration aggression hypothesis developed and reformulated by a few Yale psychologists that describe why people take their feelings out on others. In short, a person will become frustrated at someone or something that stifles them from achieving their goal, but instead of taking that thing head on for whatever reason, those feelings turn into aggression and are projected onto something else completely unrelated in order to relieve any emotional tension. Since Ugwe blocked Tai Lung from the title of Dragon Warrior, it'd be disadvantageous to actively fight against the master over his master, so he takes it out on the occupants of the valley. When push comes to shove, sometimes a beast must be caged despite allowing its anger to fester for 20 years behind bars. However, if a beast can fight out of its oppressed bindings, then it's only a matter of time until it traces back the origins of its anger. And nothing will stop a beast on the warpath. Not Shifu's new students, not even Shifu himself. Even while beating his old master, he complains about the delusions of grandeur fed to him and the agonizing training regimen all amounted to nothing since he was not granted the title he worked so hard for, and that all of his efforts were to make his father figure proud. But Shifu from the day that he found Tai Lung was and always would have been proud of him, regardless of whether his son followed in his footsteps. Listening to this revelation takes the aging Snow Leopard aback. He finally got the validation he's been searching all these years for. But considering what he had to go through to get to this point, there isn't any buyer's remorse. Tai Lung will get what he's owed for the years of work put in. Unfortunately, when he finally got a chance to read the scroll after swiping it away from Poe, he's greeted with nothing but his own reflection. Those same emotions from his initial rejection returning, which he still doesn't understand. He's always derived his worth and his status of greatness from the perception of others, especially his master Shifu. In short, he was never a self-starter. Had he committed to the training because he wanted to, versus prioritizing the dopamine boost he received from the cheers of others, his story would be different. Poe tries to tell him this by saying, there is no secret ingredient, it's just you. All that matters is you deem yourself worthy. Unable to comprehend the wisdom imparted to him, Tai Lung tries taking that same anger out on the hero, but it appropriately bounces back at him. From examining water noose, syndrome, and Tai Lung's character in context to their respective stories, the audience is presented with an insight from each of these cautionary tales. The main message from all three, villainy does not live in a vacuum. For the villain, like the hero, responds to stimuli in their environment that compels them to make the choices, despite how vile or desperate, that creates the paths they continue to follow. In the case of Henry J. Waternoose the third, by strictly collecting screams to maintain a sinking company, going so far as building a life-altering machine, fails to research alternative energy solutions like laughter that would have saved his business and bolstered his family name. Syndrome, despite his acumen for inventing, puts those skills to use to rid the world of the concept of supers, only to get back at the hero he idolized for rejecting him. Tai Lung, while able to perform the moves of a kung fu master, did not have the master's emotional fortitude and was a reactive force. Without that skill, and only driven by the praise he received from Shifu with high expectations placed on his shoulders, he allowed the disappointment bomb to burst, turning him into a snow leopard who will fight for what belongs to him. For every great hero, there's an equally great threat in their way. But hey, what do I know? <laughs>